Okay, I'll go ahead and get started by just welcoming all of you guys to Watung Yu Sawadee Kap. Welcome to all of you guys. Good morning. Nice to see you. Uh, today is a third day of a course that we're teaching here called Harmony in Relationships, helping students learn the teachings of the Buddha to develop harmony in their relationships. And some students are here for that. And I know some of you guys might just be coming for the morning and that's fine. We invite students to come in and learn, even though when I'm teaching various courses and stuff like this, uh, we have regular classes here, Sunday, Wednesday, and Saturday. And then when I'm teaching courses and retreats, students who come in on those days can just come in and join for whatever part of the course that you'd like. If, you'd, if you're planning to just be here for the morning, that's wonderful. If you decide you'd like to stay longer, either throughout the day or even tomorrow, in the next day, you're welcome to stay as long as you like and learn the teachings of the Buddha. So welcome to all of you guys here at the temple and welcome to those of you guys that are joining us online. Welcome to all of you. We're going to start our class with a guided meditation. We're doing loving kindness meditation as part of this course. And yesterday I taught loving kindness meditation and the students had an opportunity to do that. If you haven't learned loving kindness meditation with me, it's okay because I'll just guide you all the way through as we go through the meditation. We start the meditation with chanting and I see some of you guys have the chanting sheets. We have the chants over on the table there on a laminated sheet. You're welcome to get a version of that if you'd like. You'll see the Pali language of the chants and the English translations. I suspect that these chants were actually created by by the, teach, by the students of the Buddha, either during his life or after his death, rather than the Buddha himself. Because as you see in the chants, there's a lot of respect and admiration and gratitude for the Buddha. And the Buddha is not going to teach something like this in order to have students uh, do these kinds of things. Instead, the Buddha would have just shared his teachings and helped people get to this enlightened mental state. He used chanting as a way during his lifetime to help his students commit the teachings to memory because his teachings were oral during his lifetime. So the students needed a way in order to commit them to memory because they didn't write them down until after his death. So once every two weeks, they used chanting as a way to recite his teachings word for word. But then I imagine somewhere along the line, students created these chants. So I use them as a way to ease the mind into meditation. These aren't a rite, a ritual or ceremony or worship. It's not prayer. Uh, it's not anything like that. There's no mystical or magical things happening with the chants. Instead, it's just helping to ease your mind into the meditation and get more benefit out of the meditation itself. Once we get into meditation, I will guide you in breathing mindfulness meditation just for a short period of time, just to kind of start providing the ability for the mind to get some awareness of mind, concentration, training to let go. And then after a period of that, then we'll move into loving kindness meditation where I'll be doing these affirmations out loud. This is to train the mind to cultivate active goodwill towards all beings or a genuine interest in seeing all beings be well. These affirmations, you do them in internal into the mind. I'll be doing them out loud and using general statements to apply to all of us. But when you do this on your own, you would like to customize it for your specific needs and do these affirmations in the mind, which is going to transform the mind away from anger, hatred, and ill will. Because if you're going to have harmonious relationships, you're going to need to eliminate that. And even the lesser versions like frustration, annoyance, agitation, irritation, by the time you get to enlightenment, you don't even have the slightest dislike towards other beings, where in the unenlightened state, there might be people you dislike. You might have bitterness or hostility or animosity towards towards individuals. But by the time you transform your mind on the path to enlightenment, none of that is existing in the mind. You will have eliminated it. And the meditation techniques are an important part of that, but there's also learning as well that you need to do in order to learn the teachings and implement them in your daily life to uproot the pollutions out of the mind. So after the loving kindness meditation, we'll go back to a little bit of breathing mindfulness, and then we'll come out with some chanting. And then afterwards, the topic that I was planning to talk about today is true love, love without attachment. This is something that is needed in order to cultivate harmonious relationships in your life because oftentimes the unenlightened mind is misunderstanding what love is and there's something called craving, desire, attachment that's masquerading as love. And as long as you don't understand what love is or true love is and how to practice it, then you might find a lot of struggles and difficulties in your various relationships, whether it's a life partner, whether it's children, 
whether it's your parents or brothers and sisters or friends, you might notice that you're having certain challenges in these relationships. So by understanding what true love is and then learning to practice this, what you'll find is not only are your relationships becoming more and more harmonious, but also you'll receive more love because you're putting out this true love and you'll be able to identify true love when someone's actually practicing it with you. So I'm going to teach you about true love and how to actually practice this in all your various relationships. So if you'd like to join for meditation, make yourself comfortable, either seated, lying, or standing. These are the three positions we tend to use for loving kindness meditation. If you're on the floor, we usually just cross our legs lightly to allow the circulation to flow. Some people like to have multiple cushions under their rear or even put their legs off the mat. This gets the hips up in the air and allows the angle at the hips, the knees, and the ankles to be a bit less so you can keep the circulation flowing. If you're in a chair, sometimes people People like to just put their feet flat on the floor or cross at the ankles. It's really up to you. It's not about everybody doing it exactly the same way. It's about finding what's comfortable for you. The Buddha put his right hand over his left with his thumbs together and he put this into his lap. But again, it's not about everybody doing it exactly the same way. Some people like to put their palms on their thighs or on their knees. Some people put their palms up. So whatever's comfortable with your lower body and your hands and arms, just create some comfort for yourself where the body is not painful, but it's also not luxurious either. The upper body would be wise to be erect. This keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation, whereas if you were slouched, the mind would have a tendency to be complacent or dull or lethargic. But if you were real rigid, the mind would have a tendency to be overactive and uptight. So by keeping the upper body erect, the mind can be attentive and alert to do the work during meditation. So if you'd like to join in the chanting, you're welcome to. Some people might just choose to close their eyes and breathe in through the nose and out through the nose. And then after the chanting, I'll be back with some guidance. Manu-sanang 
ओ तो भगवती Okay, with the lower body and hands and arms comfortable, in the upper body erect, just close the eyes and start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Here you're just looking to establish the breath. A nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. Not forced or controlled. Just a gradual inhale through the nose. Experiencing the full breath. And then when you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. Your breath may not match up with the guidance that I'm providing, and that's okay. This is your practice. I'm just here for guidance. You can use this voice as a reminder that whenever you get to your next inhale, breathe in gradually through the nose, establishing a nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. And then whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose, experiencing the full breath. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. Once the breath is well established, start fixating the mind on the breath. Either the sound of the breath coming into the nose or the sensation of air moving over the skin into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. In, out. Breathing in. In, out. With the mind fixated on the breath, Whenever you notice that the mind moves off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. No need to observe the thought, label it, judge it, analyze it, or even try to figure out where it's coming from. Whenever you notice that the mind is moved off the breath, cut that off, let it go and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in
and out. Breathing in. and out. I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work of focusing on the breath, cutting, letting go any time the mind moves off the breath. You have nowhere to go. There is nothing to do. No one needs you right now. This is your time to focus on the breath. Breathing in and out. Continuing to focus on the breath, on your out breaths, repeat these affirmations in the mind. May I 
be peaceful. May I be safe. May I be well. May I be free of all discontentedness in the suffering it causes. May mom and dad be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. May my extended family and friends be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes.
May my neighbors and co-workers be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness in the suffering it causes. May all those who cause me harm be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness in the suffering it causes. May all those who I have harmed be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness in the suffering it causes.
all beings, wherever they reside, be peaceful. May all beings be safe. May all beings be well. May all beings be free of discontentedness in the suffering it causes. Now go back to breathing mindfulness meditation, focusing on the breath, cutting off and letting go any time the mind moves off the breath. Breathing in. And out.
If you guys would like to slowly make your way out of meditation, well, once again, just welcome all of you guys, including those of you that joined us since we started meditating. Welcome to all of you guys. I see there's a lot of you guys back there in the back. Uh, you're welcome to move up front if you like. There's plenty of space here if you're looking to spread out. You guys seem really far away, but I know that sometimes since we've installed this camera, people feel like they can't sit here in the front, but I would just like to let you know you're welcome to sit here if you'd like. For those of you guys that this is your first time here, there's a bathroom in the back of the room that you're welcome to use at any time. It's the last door on the right. Feel free to use that. There's even bathrooms outside this classroom. If you'd like to move outside for a bathroom, there's uh, signs that'll take you to the larger bathrooms. We even have water here that students have provided that you're welcome to help yourself to. So make yourself comfortable, make yourself at home. I'll share some teachings with you guys to help you on the path to enlightenment. The Buddha taught this path to enlightenment in order to help you train your mind to eliminate discontent feelings, where you can eliminate sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, boredom, loneliness, shyness, resentment, jealousy, even the slightest displeasure is eliminated from the enlightened mind. You eliminate stress, anxiety, all these discontent feelings through training the mind. Meditation is one aspect of that training, but there's other training that you need as well, other teachings that you need besides just meditation. 
This meditation that we just did, starting out with breathing mindfulness meditation, this is to help you cultivate mindfulness or awareness of mind in concentration and train the mind to easily let go. So if this is the first time you've meditated this way and your mind was bombarded with thoughts or you indulged in a thought for a period of time and then realized you needed to bring your mind back to the breath, this is very normal when someone's first starting out. You're going to have thoughts during meditation. Even when your mind's enlightened, you're still going to have thoughts. The difference is, is that in the enlightened mind, there's a quietness, there's a stillness in thoughts, or rather than following and indulging in a thought, there'll be a thought, but then there'll be a long space of just quietness and stillness, peacefulness and joy in the mind. And then there'll be another thought. And in the enlightened mind, you'll notice that thought right away. You'll be able to cut it off, let it go and bring the mind back to the breath. With the unenlightened mind, again, there's tends to be this bombardment of thoughts or an indulging in a thought, but there's going to be thoughts during your meditation. So the goal isn't to eliminate your thoughts during the meditation. It's to build this awareness of mind. So you're aware that there is a thought that you build concentration and you're able to easily let go when there is a thought. And this actually helps you in daily life because as the discontentedness arises like anger and sadness and frustration and other things like this, you'll notice it with your mindfulness and you'll be able to cut it off and let it go. And over time, as you train your mind in this way, using these teachings and others, you'll eventually get to a point where there won't be any anger that arises. There won't be any frustration or irritation or any of these other discontent feelings. The meditation we did for loving kindness, this is to transform your mind away from anger, hatred, ill will, and all those lesser versions like frustration, irritation, annoyance, uh, all those agitation, things like this, even the slightest dislike of other beings. Because as long as this is in your mind, your mind's not liberated. It's not free. I understand that there's probably people that have caused harm to you in the past, but holding on to that anger doesn't actually help you at all. It's just hurting you. So the teachings of the Buddha are to liberate your mind from all these discontent feelings. And one of the things that the mind is typically holding on to in the un- enlightened state is this anger, this hostility, this bitterness, this aggression. And you can eliminate all of that from the mind and experience improvement in your relationships where you can develop all harmonious relationships, where you don't have any hostility or bitterness in any of your relationships at all. And I understand that might not be where you are, but through gradual training and gradual practice and gradual progress, you can see improvement to your life practice into your relationships where eventually you get to the point where all your relationships are harmonious. And this just takes time to work at this. One of the biggest myths about the life story of the Buddha is that he sat under a tree, he meditated and instantly got to enlightenment. And sometimes people feel like that's what they should be able to achieve. But this isn't actually true. The Buddha took six years to get to enlightenment. He describes in his teachings that it wasn't instantaneous, that it was gradual training, gradual practice and gradual progress. So his teachings aren't about believing a whole bunch of things and then hoping that you die and something good happens. It's not about rules or commandments. It's not about forcing you or convincing you to do anything. It's not about guilt or shame or fear in order to try to convince you to do something. It's about providing you teachings to understand the mind and understand the world around you. And then you learn those teachings, you reflect on them to independently verify them, and then you practice them. And you gain this wisdom to now awaken to this wisdom where now now you can function in the world better. You can make wiser decisions that produce wholesome results. With a lack of wisdom, you will make unwise decisions that produce unwholesome results in your life. And as you're experiencing these unwholesome results, various discontent feelings in the mind, various challenges in your relationships, this is an indication to you that you still have work to do, that you still need certain wisdom to be able to cultivate, to make wiser decisions that will produce more wholesome results in your life. So learning the teachings of the Buddha, Buddha is about learning, examining, investigating, about reflecting on those to independently verify them and practice them. And getting help from a teacher, receiving guidance, having resources to help you is part of that journey. And today I'm going to be sharing with you this topic of true love, love without attachment, because this is going to really help you to develop harmonious relationships. We oftentimes miss what true love is and we're not practicing true love. And this is one of the reasons why we experience so many complications in the unenlightened state in our relationships. So by understanding what true love is, then you can start to understand that more and more deeply and you can start practicing it better and better. And you'll see that 
This will help to clear up your relationships and improve your relationships. As we go in today's class, if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask those here at the temple. If you could use a microphone that's in the white bowl here, we've got two microphones. You can pass those around. There's a gray switch on the front that if you turn that on, then you talk into the microphone, we'll be able to hear you here at the temple. And then the people online that are joining us, they'll be able to hear you as well. And then for those of you guys that are online, either in Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, if you would like to ask a question, you can put that into the comment section or in the Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and I can see that you have a question and I can call on you and then you'll be able to be heard here at the temple through our sound system. So again, welcome to all of you guys. And as you have questions, let me know and I will help you to understand the teachings of the Buddha because this is your independent journey to enlightenment. You're on your own journey. A teacher is here to guide you, but we can't give you enlightenment. Nobody can give you enlightenment. It's through your own work, your own effort, your own determination, your own diligence to learn, reflect, and practice that you'll be able to gradually improve your wisdom and get closer and closer to this enlightened mental state where the mind's peaceful, calm, serene and content with joy permanently, no longer experiencing discontent feelings. There's focus, concentration, clarity of mind, deep memory. Your personal and professional relationships will blossom. You won't even be in a bad mood anymore by the time you get to enlightenment. You'll always be in a good mood. And this will be experienced through the rest of this life. So first, let's look at a definition of Actually, first, let's talk about the Four Noble Truths a little bit. The Four Noble Truths is something that we talked about in this course, other programs that I teach. And here at the beginning of this talk about true love, I like to remind people about the second and the third Noble Truth because understanding the second and third Noble Truth helps you to understand the cause of discontentedness in the mind. And it's important to revisit this in those of you guys that haven't studied this before, it's important to understand it because this is actually what's going to help you understand true love and what you might be practicing now thinking is love, but is not actually love. So here, let me just revisit this for those of you guys that have learned this with me before, but those of you guys that have never learned this, this will be an opportunity for you to understand. So the problem in the unenlightened mind is these discontent feelings. There's conditioned pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant. The conditioned pleasant feelings are things like happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, exhilaration, euphoria. These are conditioned feelings that happy if these conditions are met. And then the problem with that is if you get your conditions met and you get that happiness, when those conditions change, now the mind's going to end up in the painful feelings, the sadness, the frustration, the irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety, or some other painful feeling. And then there's feelings what's called neither painful nor pleasant. This is kind of like uncomfortableness or displeasure or dissatisfaction. So when your mind has craving, which is this mental loss, longing and strong eagerness, this chasing after the objects of your affection, where it's longing and yearning, thinking the next new shiny object waiting around the corner is going to provide some kind of lasting satisfaction. These cravings, desires, attachments, wants, expectations, the unrelated mind will chase and chase and chase and chase and chase these things, thinking that this is going to provide some lasting satisfaction. And if you get what you want, you get pleasant feelings like happiness and excitement. But if you don't get what you want, you'll get painful feelings like sadness, frustration, irritation, and others. So the unenlightened mind is actually causing its own discontent feelings. We will typically blame the discontent feelings on other people in the unenlightened state. You might think other people are causing you to be angry or other people are annoying you, but in reality, it's your mind's craving, desire, attachment, these mental longing and strong eagerness that is causing the mind to be discontent. The mind is craving for things to be permanent. It's wanting things to be a certain way. And when things are that way, you'll experience happiness. But when you don't get things your way, the mind will experience these painful feelings. So essentially, the unenlightened mind has these various conditions that if this is true, this is true, this is true, or I get this, I get this, I get this, I get this. If this condition is met, this condition is met, this condition is met, then I will be happy. 
So if my bank account is this, if my mom does this, if my brothers and sisters do this, if my life partner, if my children do this, then I will be happy. But if those things don't occur, then you'll be sad or frustrated or irritated. This is all because of craving, desire, attachment, the mental longing, strong eagerness, wanting things to be a certain way, having certain expectations of the way things should be in the world. And when your expectations are met, you're happy. But when your expectations aren't met, then you're sad or frustrated or some other discontent feeling. This is explained to you in the three universal truths. And it's also explained to you here in the four noble truths, which I have the second and the third noble truth here for you to understand that the second noble truth is explaining to you that these discontent feelings are being caused by craving, desire, attachment, the mental longing and strong eagerness, the mind wanting things to be a certain way. And when you get things your way, again, you get those pleasant feelings, but when you don't get things your way, you get the painful feelings. The mind is craving for things to be permanent, but yet you live in an impermanent world. Everything around you is impermanent. So for example, if you've ever gotten into a relationship with a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband or a wife, when you guys first got together, you got all these pleasant feelings. This person is showing you attention. They're attracted to you. They're inviting you out to the movies, maybe go to dinner or some other thing. Maybe you're having intimate contact with each other. You're having great conversations with each other and you're getting all these pleasant feelings based on the condition that you have this boyfriend or you have this girlfriend. But now over time, the relationship dissolves or you eliminate the relationship and now you're angry or you're frustrated or you're sad or you're lonely or you're missing this person. And the reason why is the mind is holding on to this relationship, wanting it to be permanent, craving, longing, yearning, thinking if I just have this relationship, everything would be perfect in my life. So the mind's craving, it's holding on, wanting this permanence, but yet this relationship was impermanent. And it was always, you guys were together for the rest of your life, more likely than not, one of you would have died first, and then you would be alone. You would be by yourself, right? So if your mind has craving, desire, attachment, it's going to experience these discontent feelings. If the mind's craving for things to be permanent, if you have a brand new car and you get all these pleasant feelings for the brand new car, and then you park it somewhere and you come outside and you see a scratch on the car, you might get angry or frustrated. This is not from the scratch. It's not from the person who caused the scratch. What's causing that anger and frustration is the mind's craving for this car to look permanently beautiful. And it's just not possible. We're not talking about what's wise or unwise here because it's unwise to scratch somebody's car. But if you never received a scratch on your car, this would be permanence. The car would be permanent. But this car isn't permanent. It's going to arise, it's going to change, and it's going to fade away. The tires need to be changed, the wheel changed, the upholstery is going to fade, the paint color is going to fade. This car is impermanent. But if your mind's craving for this car to be permanent, then when you see a scratch or you see some other thing going on with the car, you'll be angry or sad or frustrated. This is happening when people die. If someone dies and you grieve or you're sad, you're not a bad person. You haven't done anything wrong. It's just that the mind doesn't understand what it doesn't understand and it lacks certain training. What's going on when grandma and grandpa die or mom or dad or brothers and sisters and you're grieving is the mind is craving for them to be permanent, wanting this individual to be permanently in the world, but yet they're impermanent. Because they were born, they had to die. And when you're, they die, this represents impermanence. And the unenlightened mind doesn't understand the universal truth of impermanence, that everything around you is impermanent. Same thing is true if you've had somebody go get married and you were sad or crying at a wedding or other people around you were. This is the mind craving, holding on to this person, wanting them to be permanent. And now this wedding, someone going off into the world with a partner represents impermanence to the mind and the mind doesn't understand this impermanence. So now the individual's mind might be crying or might be sad or might be uh, upset or, or feeling grief because this person's going off into the world. 
And then the same thing happens when we might send our kids to college. An individual might grieve at that time, might be sad when their kid goes to college. This is the same thing. It's this craving, desire, attachment. The mind's holding on, wanting this to be permanent, when in reality it's impermanent. These relationships are all impermanent. So it's understanding what's causing the mind to be discontent is that it's craving, desire, attachment, longing, yearning, wants, expectations. And then what will typically happen is when the mind has what we call wrong view, that you misbelieve or you have the misperception or the misunderstanding or the false uh, understanding that somebody else is causing your discontent feelings, you will typically push people away out of your life and you will think that this is going to solve the problem. When you feel angry, when you feel sad, if you don't understand that your mind is causing this itself, you'll attribute those painful feelings to something external and you will push away the person or you will push away the situation. And this is called aversion. Or you might become bitter and harsh and hostile towards somebody through your intentions, your speech, and your actions. Or you might put your expectations on somebody and trying to control them or pressure them to do things your way. And as long as you do this, you can't live harmoniously in your relationships because you're pushing people away, you're being bitter and harsh and hostile, or you're having expectations of people trying to control them. And sometimes we think that this is actually true love. We think that uh, because we love somebody, we've got to get them to do things a certain way. And we don't understand that in reality, that's the craving, that's the desire, that's the expectation, that's the want. So if you see mom or dad or brothers or sisters doing things that you disagree with, you might decide that you would like to try to get them to do things your way. This is the craving, the desire, this is the expectation. Part of understanding true love is to understand that in order to love somebody, you need to make space for them to make their own decisions, that an individual needs to be comfortable to make their own decisions, that if you put pressure on other people and you put your expectations on other people, they're going to tend to leave out of your life. If you become bitter and harsh and hostile with people, they'll tend to leave out of your life or you push people out of your life. In this way, the number of people that you can spend time with becomes fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer because your expectations are growing and growing and growing. So it's only a matter of time before somebody does something you disagree with and you push them away, become bitter and harsh and hostile, or put your expectations on somebody. So understanding true love is to first understand what craving desire attachment is because craving desire attachment is kind of masquerading as love that we think that because we love somebody we want them to do these things but that's your own wants that may not be what other people are interested in doing so as long as you have this craving desire attachment in the mind you might find that you're trying to force your way onto other people and the mind thinks that if you can just get your cravings fulfilled that everything will be perfect in the world but in reality what you're doing is you're pushing people away. Because if somebody pressured you into attempting to do what they want you to do, you wouldn't like that. You would dig your heels in. You would be like, why is this person putting all this pressure on me to do things the way they want? Right. But the unenlightened mind doesn't realize that doing to other people, that the mind is putting its expectations on other people and trying to control other people. So with craving, desire, attachment, masquerading as love, The way that we think is we meet somebody brand new. Maybe this is a a love interest, somebody that you would like to fall in love with. You start getting attracted to this person. And after a period of time of spending time with them, you might say to them, I have fallen in love with you or I love you. I have fallen in love with you. And then over a period of time, as the relationship goes on, your expectations might grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And more and more, they're finding it hard to meet your expectations or you're finding it hard to meet their expectations. And eventually the relationship becomes so discontent that it's over and you guys end the relationship. And now you might say, I have fallen out of love with you. I don't love you anymore. This isn't actually love, described as love, and this is what the unenlightened mind thinking is love, but it's not. It's craving, desire, attachment. It's saying, if you do all these things that I want you to do, I will say I love you. But when you stop doing the things that I want you to do, then I'll say I don't love you anymore. 
This is the selfish desires of the craving desire attachment that's masquerading as love. The mind thinks that this is love, but it's really not. It's the craving desire attachment. So as long as there are certain things in your mind that the mind says, if you do this, 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 then I will love you and I will say I've fallen in love with you. And then when you stop doing those things that I want you to do, now I'll say I've fallen out of love with you. I don't feel the passion anymore. What that really is, that passion, that burning fire, that's actually the craving desire attachment. When you understand what true love is, you understand that this isn't actually love. Putting expectations on others, control others, isn't going to produce harmonious relationships in your life. And the more that you choose to do that with others, then people are going to do that with you. If you're finding that people are kind of pressuring you and trying to put their expectations on you to a certain extent, this is because this is what you're doing also. So you need to train your mind. This loving kindness meditation that we just did to transform the mind, this is to transform your mind. It's not to change other people. Sometimes people think that because of those affirmations where we're saying, may mom be peaceful, may mom be safe, well and free of discontentedness that somehow we're trying to change mom but that's not what this path to enlightenment is it's about changing your own mind and transforming your own mind so understanding what true love is true love is this care for another person not wanting anything specific from them not wanting anything from the relationship other than to see that person be well and be peaceful and understanding that for someone else to feel well and to feel peaceful it's based on their decisions. It's not based on your decisions. Sometimes we feel like in the unenlightened state due to our cravings, desires, attachments, that we know what's best for other people. And then we kind of try to rush into their life and we try to tell them what they should be doing in their life. And we have certain expectations and we want to control them. Maybe mom or dad or brothers or sisters, a life partner, people like this, we might try to convince them to do things our way not realizing that this is just our way of doing things. This is our experiences. But in order for someone to be loved and in order for you to practice love, you're going to need to get to a point where you're not putting your expectations on others and you feel comfortable to let everybody make their own decisions. As long as you're putting expectations on others, people will choose to walk away and not be part of your uh, life any longer. So a relationship with true love is formed and conducted with no other intentions or interest other than to see a person succeed in life in whatever way they choose to progress and walk forward, that we love them as they are. Sometimes when we get in relationships with individuals, there are certain things that we like about them, but then we try to change these other things about them. We're trying to change that person. And we think that this is a way to love them is by changing them. But that is going to put you in a situation where it's just your cravings, desires, attachments, your wants, your expectations, trying to change that person rather than just loving them as they are. What you would ultimately like to get to is not where there's all these conditions where it's you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this, you meet my expectations, I will love you. When you stop meeting my expectations, I won't love you anymore. That's not true love. What you would like to get to is to realize because of impermanence, this universal truth of impermanence, you're not going to agree with everything that people do. Whether it's your mom, whether it's your dad, whether it's your brothers or sisters or life partners, you're not going to agree with everything they do. I don't think there's anybody in here that agrees 100% with everything our parents did as we grew up. But you'll need to learn how to love the person while disagreeing with their decisions. Because everybody's had different experiences in our life, we're going to make decisions differently. All of us making decisions exactly the same way is impossible. That would be permanence. Everybody's had different experiences, so we're going to make decisions differently. And if we can only love somebody that agrees with us and we agree with them, then you're only going to love one person because there's only one person that you agree with 100%. Do you know who that person is that you agree with 100%? Yourself, right? You only agree with this being who you are now. Everyone else you're going to have disagreements with. But disagreements doesn't mean fight to death. 
It doesn't mean you have to convince them to agree with you. When you have craving, desire, attachment in the mind in your relationships, you might try to advocate for your opinions, for your views, and you might be trying to convince other people to agree with you because there's that craving in there wanting everybody to agree with you. And if everybody agrees with you, you feel better about your own thoughts and your own feelings and so forth. But when you understand impermanence and you understand that it's impossible for everybody to agree with you because of the universal truth of impermanence, then you understand it's only a matter of time before you interact with someone who has different opinion than you. It's only a matter of time. And if someone has a different opinion or different thoughts or different ideas, that's wonderful. That's what makes the world unique and wonderful is that we all have different ideas and different thoughts. But if you can only spend time with people who agree with you, then the number of people are going to become less and less and less because it's only a matter of time, one year, two years, three years before you find something that this person disagrees with you about. So it's learning how to love the person while disagreeing with certain choices that they make. You might not agree with all the various choices your mom and dad or your brothers and sisters and all these other people make, but you can still love the person. So you might have people in your life that are trying to put their expectations on you and trying to control you and trying to get you to do things their way. And you need to identify that as that is their cravings. That's their wants. That's their expectations. You're trying to eliminate your own cravings, desires, attachments, wants, and expectations. The last thing you're interested in doing is adopting somebody else's cravings, desires, attachments. So when other people are trying to force you and wanting and expecting certain things from you, you'll need to learn how to be skillful and not allowing that to occur in terms of you adopting it. It will occur to a certain degree. People will potentially try to do that with you, but your choice to adopt that as your cravings, desires, attachments, it's your decision. So at the, towards the, the other later part of this course, I'm going to teach you guys the art of the friendly no, which is how to say no without saying no. It's a, helpful way for you to interact with people who are trying to put their expectations or they have certain cravings on putting those on you. You can learn how to say no without saying no, and this will help you in your relationships. So in situations where people are putting their expectations or their wants on you, you're going to need to get really good at identifying that and realizing that that's what they want, that's what they expect, and that's not going to solve the problem. If they get angry because you're not meeting their expectations, you're not going to solve the problem by meeting their expectations. Because as soon as you meet their expectations, their expectations are going to change. And now they're going to want something else and they're going to want something else and they're going to expect something else. So if your parents or your siblings have certain expectations and you work feverishly to get to those expectations, then you might get there and they'll be happy for a couple of days or a couple of hours or maybe a couple of weeks, but then their expectations are going to change or they're going to move over here. And now they're going to try to convince you to meet those. And then you try to chase after those and meet those. And then they're going to change them again. So as long as you keep chasing after meeting other people's expectations, then you're just going to be chasing after their cravings, desires, attachments, They're going to get happy for a period of time if you meet those, but then they're going to completely change. It's like chasing your tail around in a circle. So you need to get really good at identifying other people's cravings, desires, attachments, and not adopting those as your own because those people aren't necessarily practicing true love. But then you need to get really good at not putting your cravings, desires, attachments on others so that less and less they will do that, uh, not do that for you. So I'm sure there's people in your life that have true love for you, like your parents, your siblings, stuff like this. They have true love. I'm sure this is that in the unenlightened state, when you don't understand what true love is, then there's this craving, desire, attachment that's polluting that. So your parents may have this unconditional love for you where they love you unconditionally. It doesn't matter what you do, they will love you. That's what true love is, that there's this unconditional love. No matter what you do, they will absolutely love you. They have a genuine interest in seeing you be well. But then what happens is people have these cravings, these desires, these attachments, these expectations that pollute this love. 
And now you can't feel their love 100%. And if you're doing that, people can't feel your love 100% either because you have these expectations or these wants that are polluting your true love. So what you're doing on this path to enlightenment, among other things, when you start understanding true love and you're interested in practicing true love, is you're getting your cravings, desires, attachments out of the way in your relationships so that now your true love through more and more and people can feel that and people can experience your true love that you don't want anything from them you don't expect anything from them you're not trying to control them you're not putting obligations on them you're not trying to force them or control them to do anything you realize that in order for people to be well they need to feel comfortable making their own decisions so let me give you a couple examples to illustrate this Let's just say you and your life partner are living together or going on a date or what have you, uh, or, or let's do it this way. Let's say you guys are living together. Okay. And now let's just say, uh, you're, you go to your life partner and you say, Hey, uh, would you like to go to the movies? There's this new Superman movie that came out. I would like to go see Superman. And they're like, no, I'm fine. I'm going to stay here. What you might do if you have craving, desire, attachment is you might say, no, oh, come on, you got to go. It's really a good movie. Like, come on, I want you to go. Like, it's playing this Saturday. Like, we should go. It'll be really fun. Like, no, I'm fine. I'm going to stay here. Ah, oh, come on. You're no fun. Like, come on, come with me. You got to come to the movie. It's going to be really great. This is your craving, desire, attachment, <clears throat> wanting this person to come with you. And now you're putting this pressure and this expectation on this person and trying to get what you want, which is this person to come with you. This person would like to stay home. They're interested in relaxing at home, but because of your cravings, because of your attachments, you feel like the only way for you to enjoy this movie is if this person comes with you. So you might put these expectations on the person, these ones, and try to pressure them to do things your way, where in reality, the best thing to do would be, oh, you would like to stay home? Okay, great. I'm going to go to the movie and I'll see you when I get back, right? That's the best way. Like she gets to stay home or he gets to stay home, enjoying the rest and relaxation, and you get to go to the movie, which is what you would like to do, right? Even if you're successful at pressuring your partner into going to the movies with you, they're probably going to be grumpy and irritable when they go because they really wanted to stay at home. They're only coming to the movies with you because you kind of pressured them enough. And maybe they're enough, they're attached enough to you that they've decided to come with you. So the way to create harmony in this relationship is when you ask somebody a question, would you like to go to the movies? Would you like to go to dinner? Would you like to go to the park? Would you like to go shopping? Would you like to go on this trip to Thailand? Whatever it is, you ask them and they, whatever their reply is, whatever their answer is, <clears throat> you just accept that. That's loving somebody. That's loving them as they are. That whatever they've decided, that's their decision and you feel comfortable with that. Because in order to love somebody as they are and get rid of craving, desire, attachment, you need to accept other people's decisions and not try to force them or control them to do things <clears throat> the way that you want them to do it. Because that's coming from your own selfish desires. And whenever you're making decisions through cravings, you're going to produce unwholesome results because it's unwise to make decisions based in craving, desire, attachment. So if you put this pressure on this individual and you're really wanting them to come to the movies with you, either they're going to stay home and you're going to be angry because your craving's not getting fulfilled, or they're going to come with you and they're going to be angry because they're not getting to stay home and their craving's not fulfilled. So the best way to peacefully coexist with others and be harmonious is when you ask somebody something or you invite somebody to somewhere, whatever their answer is, you just accept it. It's either a yes or it's a no. Or maybe it's a, let me think about it. We've got a few days until Saturday. I'll think about it and let you know. Okay, great. Think about it. And then whatever they answer, you just accept that answer. Right? But when you try to pressure this person into doing things your way, that's your cravings. And now feeling pressured in the relationship, they're going to feel uncomfortable. So if you're looking to get to true love with individuals, you're going to need to make space in your life for people to make their own decisions and then feel comfortable with whatever decision they make. Okay. You also need to learn how to love yourself. Oftentimes, when the mind is polluted with craving, anger, and ignorance, these three pollutions or three poisons that the Buddha talks about, these three unwholesome roots, you might have difficulty loving yourself. 
You might have this negative self-talk in the mind. You might be degrading yourself, looking down on yourself, having negative thoughts of this being who you are. So you're going to need to learn how to love yourself. And one of the things that I recommend for people is, of course, breathing or uh, loving kindness meditation, because loving kindness meditation is helping you to be able to cultivate that love. That's why we start with, may I be peaceful, safe, well, and free of discontentness, because you need to cultivate loving kindness for this being who you are. But also, you can do things where you go out alone. Some of you guys travel to Thailand alone. It's wonderful to go on holiday alone or go to the movies alone or go to dinner alone. In some cultures, people are taught that this is like, oh, you're a loser if you go to the movies alone or if you go to dinner alone and you're sitting in a restaurant by yourself, that somehow this is bad or or wrong. But you're going to need that alone time, first of all, because you need to fall in love with yourself right? You need to be able to fall in love and have love for for yourself. But also you're going to need that alone time to be able to think through your thoughts. If you're always around other people, you're always having this interaction and conversation with people. You're not going to be able to think through your own thoughts and be introspective and reflective about what's going on in your own life and what's going on in your own mind. So by taking yourself out to dinner and enjoying a really nice dinner with yourself, this is to love yourself, not in a conceited way, but that you have love and you have care for yourself, right? And you go to the movies and enjoy the movies by yourself or you go for a walk in the park by yourself. If you don't enjoy spending time alone, who's going to enjoy spending time with you, right? You need to be able to enjoy spending time with yourself and then people will enjoy spending time with you because you enjoy spending time with yourself. But if you don't enjoy spending time alone with yourself, why would anybody ever enjoy spending time with you? So you're going to need to develop this love in your mind for this being who you are for the, for yourself and one of the ways to do that is loving kindness meditation but also going out going on hikes going on holidays going to dinners and movies going on different events with yourself and if you meet other people while you're out at these events great and if you don't meet other people while you're out at these events that's fine too enjoy spending time alone and this might feel you might feel lonely when you do this initially you might feel bored If you have craving, desire, attachment to always have people with you, you might feel lonely and you might feel bored, but you're not going to solve that by staying at home or by taking people with you every time. The way that you eliminate your craving is put the mind in the situation that it doesn't like. Put your mind in the situation that it feels uncomfortable with. So if you feel lonely or bored being alone when you go out, go out more. Go out alone. Spend time alone. Here in Thailand, if you go to the mall, you'll see a good number of people alone. Or if you go to a restaurant, sometimes you'll see people alone spending time with their own thoughts, right? This is really helpful in your life. So this love that you're looking to cultivate for all beings, you need to cultivate it for yourself as well. You're not actually falling in love with people and out of love with people. What you're actually doing is you're falling into craving, desire, attachment with people. And you're falling out of craving, desire, attachment with people. If you have true love for somebody, which is unconditional love, you can't fall into love and you can't fall out of love. You just love them as they are. So this, you can just love everybody in the world, meaning you have a genuine interest in seeing all beings be well. If you're falling into love and out of love, that means you have certain expectations They're meeting those expectations, so you're saying, I would love you. But in reality, you're saying, you're meeting my expectations. And now you're not meeting my expectations anymore, and I've fallen out of love with you. But you're not really falling out of love. You're just choosing to say, hey, you're not meeting my expectations anymore, so I don't want to be around you. That's what you're essentially saying. So when we talk about falling in love and falling out of love, it's not possible to fall in love or out of love. You either love the person or you don't. You either would like to see them be well. You would like to see them uh, do wonderful things in the world and understanding that in order for them to do that, they need to make their own decisions and you can just love them as they are. Understanding you're going to disagree with some of their choices and decisions in life. You also need to get to the point where you can have love for your parents and your caregivers. The Buddha provides teachings on this. He talks about our parents and our caregivers as our original teachings. And I have some words of the Buddha here to help you guys understand this through his own words. I share his words throughout the various classes, courses, and retreats that I share in the books and resources and so forth. This is a very impactful teaching 
that it illustrates something that oftentimes people are struggling with. The first part is going to teach you about how to love parents, but then the second part is going to teach you how to repay this debt of gratitude. So I'll teach it to you in, in a couple of sections here. I'm going to read it, then I'll pause and kind of teach it to you, then I'll read some more. The Buddhist teachings, you don't need to interpret them. Uh, what I'm doing for you is helping you reflect on them and gain some better understanding, but you could probably read this and gain some understanding out of it yourself. But let me help you here. What it says is this is titled repaying one's mother and father. Monks, there are two persons that cannot easily be repaid. What two? One's mother and father. Even if one should carry about one's mother on one shoulder <clears throat> and one's father on the other, and while doing so, should have a lifespan of a hundred years, live for a hundred years, and it should, and if one should attend to them by anointing them with balms, by massaging, bathing, and rubbing their limbs, and they even void their urine and excrement there. One would still not have it done enough for one's parents, nor would one have repaid them. Even if one, sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing this, my eyes a little bit blurry. I'm getting older and older all the time. <laughs> even if one were to establish one's parents as supreme lords and rulers over the great earth, abounding in the seven treasures, one still would not have done enough for one's parents, nor would one have repaid them. Okay, so I'm going to pause here and explain what the Buddha is talking about. So what the Buddha is talking about is if you have these parents, your mother and father, and you carried one on one shoulder and one on the other shoulder, and you were to live for a hundred years, carrying them for this entire hundred of years, and now you're massaging them, you're bathing them, you're rubbing their limbs, you're uh, cleaning up their urine and their feces, their excrement, that you haven't done enough for your parents if this is what you actually choose to do. And then, even if you give them all this riches and all these material possessions, this, you know, seven treasures, and they're rulers over the entire world, the Buddha says you still haven't done enough for your parents. You haven't repaid them enough. What he's talking about repaying your parents for is that your parents are your original teachers. They're the ones who brought you into this world. They're the ones who... Your mother went through that nine months of difficult time carrying the baby and then actually the delivery. Getting into this human life is actually the best thing that could ever happen for you. As you're, you've had this cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect through these countless rebirths, now to get into this human life, you have the opportunity to get to enlightenment, get to this peace and calm, serenity, contentedness with joy, train your mind to get to that uh, permanent joy and permanent peacefulness and escape the cycle of rebirth now from this human existence. So getting into a human existence is the best thing that you could ever uh, experience. And now being in this uh, life of a human being, your parents had to do a certain amount of work and effort in order to help you to sustain your life. And this is the next thing the Buddha is going to teach you. He says, for what reason? Why haven't you done enough? Why haven't you repaid your parents enough? He says, Parents are of good help or of great help to their children. They bring them up, feed them, and show them the world. So this is what your parents have done for you that the Buddha is saying you have this, essentially this debt of gratitude that you would like to repay to your parents. And this is part of cultivating love for your parents. So now the Buddha says, okay, if you've done all these things, if you've given them all this material possessions, you haven't done enough for your parents to repay them because those material possessions, they're impermanent. They're going to arise, they're going to change, they're going to fade away. Okay, you give your mom or your dad a brand new car, you give them a brand new house, you give them all this money. Okay, those are just material things. But now the Buddha explains to you how to really, truly repay your parents and show this love for them. He says, sorry, I need to. He says, but monks, if when one's parents lack confidence, one encourages, settles, and establishes them in confidence. If when one's parents are unwholesome, 
one encourages, settles, and establishes them in virtuous behavior or moral conduct. If when one's parents are selfish, one encourages, settles, and establishes them in generosity. If when one's parents are unwise, one encourages, settles, and establishes them in wisdom. In such a way, one has come one has done enough for one's parents, repaid them, and done more than enough for them. Okay, so what the Buddha is talking about here is helping your parents to understand the path to enlightenment. Because if you could press a button and your parents would stay angry and hateful or frustrated or angry or irritated or annoyed or stressed or having anxiety, if you could press that button and they would stay stressed and anxious for the rest of their life, or you could press this button and your parents would be peaceful and joyful for the rest of their life, which button would you press? Would you press this one or this one? Would you press this one where they'd be peaceful and joyful for the rest of their life? Okay, so most people would probably press that one, right? Well, you can't press a button in order to, for your parents to be peaceful and joyful for the rest of their life. It's not possible. But helping them where you see that they're challenged, this is something that you can do. You can help establish them in this wisdom, in these other these four qualities that the Buddha is teaching. But you can't force your parents. You can't force your, your, your sisters and brothers to do things. But you could potentially recommend or advise. And this is where you can understand true love, that true love, it doesn't mean that you don't care about them. It doesn't mean that you don't ever help someone. It doesn't mean that you don't ever uh, offer them advice or suggestions. It's about how you do things, right? If you were to try to force things onto your family, then this would be problematic because they're going to feel pressured. You're having craving. If they do things your way, you'll get happy. If they don't do things your way, you'll get sad or frustrated or angry and it'll damage your relationships. But what the Buddha is talking about here is when someone lacks confidence, what he's talking about his confidence in him in his teachings because the more you learn his teachings the more you're going to see that they absolutely lead to enlightenment they absolutely lead to this peace and joy you're going to see that your mind is becoming more and more peaceful if you learn the true teachings and you're practicing them so where you see your parents lacking confidence in the buddha the buddha is saying okay try to settle and establish them in this confidence and you might do that once or twice or maybe three times and if they're just not interested then okay they're just not interested and you move on. But having tried to establish them in confidence, the Buddha is saying, okay, you've done enough for your family or you've done enough for your parents. And then the next thing he talks about is that when you see your parents that are doing unwholesome things, then you try to establish them in this virtuous behavior or this moral conduct. So when you see your parents into unwholesome things, so like when I was growing up, my grandparents, for example, grew up in a very different time than me. They grew up during uh, the World War II and my grandfather went off to uh, Asia, to Japan. He was killing Asian people. They grew up in an America that uh, was uh, segregated between African Americans and Caucasians, and they had a certain amount of racism in their mind as they were as I was growing up. And I would hear this sometimes, and I would just politely talk to Grandma, and I would politely talk to Grandpa, and try to help them see something different. And slowly over time they let go of those views and they started to develop love for all beings, particularly when their grandson was uh, dating Asian women and when their granddaughter was dating African-American men and had children of African-American descent. And I had children that were have Asian background. So they started to slowly understand like, okay, we can love all beings, right? So slowly but surely, I helped them see something better. And this is a way to repay your parents. Right. And then the next thing he talks about here is that when they're selfish, that you establish them in generosity. So if you see your parents are holding on to things and very selfish, if you understand the Buddhist teachings, you understand that generosity is a practice to train the mind to eliminate craving, desire, attachment. So by helping your parents to develop generosity in their life, it's going to help them to eliminate craving, desire, attachment. And you'll need to find very selective ways to do this, very humble ways, because oftentimes our parents aren't interested in learning from us. Us, right? Because they see themselves as, as being above us, perhaps. So when we would do this, like with my wife's parents, we would sit on the floor, we would have her parents sit on a sofa or something. We would maybe bring them some water. We would bring them some fruit. We would talk to them about different things. And then slowly but surely, we would lean into starting to talk about different things 
teachings that would maybe help them if they were open to it. And we would find these skillful ways to be able to help them. And then that's the last quality too that the Buddha is saying here is that if you notice that your parents are unwise, that you try to establish them in wisdom. But then, you know, as I mentioned, if you're doing this multiple times and this just, they're just not interested, you're going to need to step back and understand not to have craving, desire, attachment. So there are certain people in my family that I've talked to once or twice or so, maybe three times, and they're just not interested in understanding anything about the teachings of the Buddha. And okay, that's their decision. But if you kept trying to force them, notice the Buddha is not telling you to force people to try to understand how to become a better and better person through the teachings of the path to enlightenment. But he's just saying, when you notice that your parents are struggling, try to settle them, try to establish them, try to help them along. But if you've done that two or three times and they're just not interested, the Buddha is saying, okay, you've done enough for your, for your parents, that all these material possessions that we sometimes think about giving to our family members, this isn't going to satisfy this ability for them to be able to get to this peaceful and joyful mental state and repay this debt of gratitude that you might start to develop for your parents to be able to have this human life and now be able to make your way to enlightenment. So this is a teaching from the Buddha about having respect and gratitude for our parents and then how to repay that, that debt of gratitude. And then the last thing that I'll share on this topic of true love before I open up to any questions that you guys have is about life partners, is that sometimes you might find yourself as you're on the path to enlightenment, you either have a life partner or you might be looking to, to get a life partner and that's something that you would like to pursue. And if you're going to do that, the advice that I share with you in the book under this chapter 15 and that I'll share with you here is that if you're looking for a life partner, it's really helpful to find somebody that is interested in doing the work on the path to enlightenment because you're going to be understanding things and practicing certain things that if you have a partner that's completely not interested in this kind of thing and improving their mind, that you guys will probably have certain struggles. You're going to be understanding craving, desire, attachment more and more and eliminating your cravings, desires, attachments. You're going to be understanding true love more and more and practicing true love. And if they're not interested, it's okay. You can still do the work and you can still have a relationship and you can still go forward. But in a situation where both parties are interested in developing their mind and understanding these teachings, you'll find that there'll be a cohesion that is really wonderful in your relationship. So I'll give you some examples. Like if you're learning about craving, desire, attachment, which is this longing and yearning and holding on to somebody very tightly and that this would be unwise, that it's going to cause discontentedness in your relationship relationships and you're training your mind to not hold on to them very tightly and you're getting to the point where you can enjoy time with them you thoroughly have fun uh you're you obviously love them and you like to care for them and take care of them but you're not attached to them that's what you ultimately would like to get to with true love but if they're attached and they're having attachment they might go on a business trip for example and then they come back or they call you on their trip and say hey honey did you miss me and you're like nope I didn't miss you. And they're like, ah, oh, they think that's the love. They think if you miss them, that you're missing them because of love. And if you don't miss them, they might think that you don't love them. But it's not the love that's causing an individual to miss another person. If you miss your life partner, if you miss your parents, if you miss your children, this is because of craving, desire, attachment. The mind's holding on and it's wanting this person in your life permanently. And now when you're away from them, the mind is discontent. You're missing this person. So if you're walking in one direction towards enlightenment and they're not, and they're staying, their mind's becoming more and more liberated, more and more peaceful, more and more joyful, and they're staying stuck in this uh, hostility perhaps, or this anger, or this frustration, or this agitation. And this is going to be very challenging because you're going to look at the world in one way through non-attachment and non-craving, non-clinging. You're going to be looking at the world through this true love where you're not interested in forcing people to do things. And if they're not doing those same things, they might be trying to force you or control you to do things. Uh, so by having a partner that is learning and practicing the similar teachings as you, it will help create a lot more cohesion in your relationships. Uh, and also, I should share that it doesn't mean that they need to be Buddhist. It doesn't mean they need to come to the same uh, temple as you. It doesn't mean any of those things. But what I say when they, I, I share, share that they're learning similar teachings as you, 
that these kinds of teachings show up in various traditions, right? Like you can learn Christianity or Muslim teaching, Hinduism and other things like this, where oftentimes these teachings are showing up. So like I go to an Indian restaurant here in Chiang Mai where the waiter is super polite. He's very kind and friendly and respectful. He's very loving. He's uh, very accommodating. He's very helpful. Um, and when you talk to him, he practices Hinduism, right? And he understands that he doesn't try to force or control things on his customers. He learned this through Hindu teachings. And there's other teachings like that that are teaching these kinds of things. So it doesn't mean that you need to go out and, you know, find a partner, force them to come to the classes that you're learning from, the same temple and all these things. But you would like to look at the wisdom that you're learning and the way that you view the world through things like non-attachment and true love and maybe the five priests where you understand that if you're killing, stealing, having sexual misconduct, if you're lying and taking substances that cause heedlessness, this is going to produce harm in your life. So if you're choosing uh, have a partner as a life partner, you can look through that wisdom that the Buddha has shared with you and then make choices about who to involve in your life as a life partner. And then this will produce wholesome results for you based on you looking at this situation through the wisdom that you have about the teachings, even though they might have learned those things from other places. So individuals are going to be learning from different uh, different ways. And it doesn't mean that your partner has to absolutely be doing exactly the same things as you. That would be, uh, that would be permanent, but you would be wise to make decisions to include people in your life that are, uh, making wholesome and wise decisions because any decisions that you make to involve somebody in your life is going to be impactful for you as a life partner. This person is like a CEO or a COO, Right? Like if you had a company, if you had a business and you were say like on the, 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 the board of uh, the, the company or of this company and you were looking to hire a CEO or a COO for your company, this is a very impactful decision that if you hire the right person for this job, your company can be wildly successful. But if you hire the person that isn't right for this job and isn't the right fit, your company can really go and become uh, you know, unsuccessful. So if you're choosing someone to be on your team as a life partner, you would like to make a wise choice because this is an impactful decision that's going to impact you for a very long time in your life. So you'd really like to take your time, not only looking at this person's uh, qualities through your wisdom of the teachings of the Buddha, not in a judgmental way, right, where you're looking down on them, but you're just using discernment and wise decision making. Not only are you interested in doing that, but you would also like to take your time in making any decisions about a life partner. Sometimes when there's craving, desire, attachment to have a life partner, an individual might, gosh, I just need to get somebody. And if I just get this person, then everything will be perfect. And you kind of cast all your dreams and all your wishes onto this person. If you're not fulfilled currently, and you have craving, desire, attachment, you think that this person is going to fulfill your all your wishes and all your dreams, you might be casting all your expectations and your cravings and your wants onto this person, thinking that they're going to provide you this lasting satisfaction. You might look at them as your prince charming or your princess charming. And then as you guys get together and your relationship goes on, you might realize that this is a person struggling in the world just like you. And in fact, they're not going to solve all your problems. That in reality, you guys are together now, both having different challenges. And the best thing to have with a partner is someone who's willing to solve problems with you. Someone who's a, a very good problem solver. If you and them are really good at communicating and solving problems together, then no matter what you encounter, any kind of issues or challenges along your life, you'll figure them out together. So early on in your relationship, even before you're thinking about, you know, long-term relationship or marriage or anything like that, it would be wise to take your time and really slowly develop your communication skills, your ability to conversate, your ability to do things together, but also the ability to do things separately. If you guys are in a home together, doing things separately and being content and joyful with that, or you going out with your friends 
alone without them? Are you going out alone without them and them going out alone without you? This is really helpful to train your mind that, okay, you guys are going to have your together time, but you're going to have your alone time too. And now when you guys are together, you thoroughly enjoy that. You have great conversations, but when you're apart, you're completely fine with that too. And you don't miss each other. So if you can find a partner where you guys are good at communicating, looking at issues, sitting down together, talking out your issues and your challenges and resolving them without blaming each other for what it is that you're experiencing, that you take responsibility for the challenges that you're experiencing, that you understand any feelings that you're having, like sadness or anger or frustration, it's being caused by your own mind. And you have a partner that's willing to do the same thing, which is they accept their own feelings as being from their own mind. This is very crucial. And this is why it's important to have a partner that's coming from things from the same perspective as you. Because if you've learned the Four Noble Truths and you understand that your mind is causing your own discontent feelings, but you have a partner that doesn't understand that, then that means that they're probably going to be blaming you for all their feelings and all their experiences and all the challenges and difficulties in their life. And if they're constantly blaming you for all their struggles and you know that that's not true, you guys will really struggle and be challenged. So if you have a partner that at least understands the Four Noble Truths and establishes right view where they understand that their mind is causing their own discontent feelings, and then you guys become really good at conversating, discussing issues and challenges and problem solving with each other and doing this during the dating process. Here in Thailand, they actually don't call it dating. They call it learning each other. That when you meet somebody, you're actually learning each other. And you spend about three months or six months or so, a year, whatever, learning each other. And can I get along with this person? You learn each other. And then over time, as you're learning to conversate, as you're learning to solve problems with each other, as you're learning to address certain issues and challenges that you're encountering, you're learning each other. And How do we solve problems? Are we good at this? Are we a good team? Because oftentimes what we do with crave and desire attachment in our relationships is we want things our way and we advocate and we argue and we we become angry try to force people to do things our way and we can only walk away from that conversation if we feel like we got our way and this person is doing it our way but you're going to need to be comfortable coming into a conversation with your partner with a completely open mind realizing that you're going to share certain opinions about how to solve this issue. They're going to share certain opinions, how to solve this issue. And then when you guys get to the end of that conversation, whatever you agree on, it's our decision. And you might only have 10% of what you were thinking in that decision, or it might be 90% of you. It's not going to be 50, 50. Typically it might be a hundred percent. Their ideas were way better than yours. And you go forward with that. And if you don't have craving, desire, attachment, and what you're looking for is harmonious relationships, in a successful outcome, in a successful decision, that when you guys come together to talk, it's not about getting things your way. It's about finding what is the best solution to this particular challenge. And hey, if you got better ideas than me, that's wonderful. Toss them into the pot. Let's talk about them. And if we walk away from this conversation and 100% of the decision that we've made is from you, outstanding. That doesn't need to be from me. It doesn't even have to be 50% from me. So if you come together in a relationship where you guys can talk and conversate and you can problem solve together and understand that you're not going to get things your way, then this is really helpful for the mind. And this can be a practice of true love where you make space in your relationship for what is the wisest decision for us in this situation. And you might not be able to see that wise decision. It might be your partner that has the best decision and being comfortable with that. Or it might be a combination of both of your decisions. It could potentially be 50-50, but it might be 80-20 or it might be 90-10 or it might be 95, 5% of your ideas are in there. But if you don't have craving, desire, attachment, then you'll be completely comfortable with that. So finding a life partner that is going to be conducive to problem solving and conversating and understanding that their mind is causing their own anger and sadness. So that way you guys aren't blaming each other and you're taking responsibility for whatever feelings you have. This can be really helpful. And then you guys create a really nice, wonderful life for each other or with each other, but with non-attachment. As long as there's attachment in your relationships, whether it's a life partner, your parents, your children, or anybody else, as long as you have attachment, there's going to be discontentedness. 
There's going to be anger. There's going to be sadness. There's going to be frustration. So in the relationships where you're the most angry, that's where you're having the most attachment. The relationships where you find it the most difficult to talk polite and kind and friendly, those are the relationships you have the most attachment to. And as I've mentioned previously in this course, there's some relationships on this path to enlightenment that you might choose to let go of and completely move on. There's other relationships that you're more committed to that you're going to work on your own mind and that person's also willing to do work and you'll sort those relationships out. But then there's a third category of relationships or brand new people that you haven't even met yet that you will forge those new relationships and you'll only ever be loving and kind and you won't be controlling or you won't try to put your expectations on this person and you'll find that your relationships will go really, really well. So when you can understand your own attachments and you can identify other people's attachments too, when you're having attachments, you can restrain your mind and pull them back. And when you see other people having craving, desire, attachment for you, you'll learn how to skillfully help them so that that doesn't occur. You don't allow people to get attached to you, but you can enjoy your time together. You can have very fulfilling experiences way more than you ever thought possible. You can get to the point where you never have a bitter or harsh word in any of your relationships at all. Now, in the past, you haven't had the wisdom of how to do that, but you can cultivate the wisdom and you can train your mind to get to the point where you're never bitter, you're never harsh, you're never hostile, you're never trying to force or control anybody, and you feel very comfortable with everybody making their own decision, and this is what's going to produce the most harmony in your relationships. And it's the Eightfold Path, which is the core central teaching of the Buddha, that is going to guide you how to do that. And that's why I taught that on the first day of this course, and I teach it in the other classes, programs, retreats, and things that I share, is that Eightfold Path is such a crucial teaching for you to learn and develop in your life, because that's what's going to ultimately help you clear out your cravings, desires, attachments, and get to the point where more and more this true love can shine through, and people will be able to feel that, that you're not trying to control them or force them, but you understand that, yes, I'm going to disagree with some of the decisions that this person makes, but I can love the person. And loving the person is loving them as they are, being interested in seeing them be well, and realizing that them making their own decisions is part of that. So this is everything I had to share with you guys on this particular topic. I'm going to open up to any questions that you guys might have here at the temple or those of you guys online. If you guys would like to ask questions, just feel free to get the microphone, ask any questions, or those of you guys online, you can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or raise your hand electronically in Zoom, and I'll see your question. Do you guys have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Natalie, you have a hand? Yeah, if you could use the mic. I know when you were here last time, we didn't have all this sound equipment, but now we, we have all of this. Um. I think there's a switch on. Yeah, it's on. I see the light. Okay. Sure. Sure. How do you avoid other people being attached to yourself in whatever type of relationship? Okay. So if somebody's going to get attached to you, that's what's going on in their mind, but you'll see the symptoms of it. So for example, if somebody sends you a text message and then they get angry because you haven't replied in five or 10 minutes, they're attached to you and getting that reply from you. Or if somebody calls you and you don't pick up the phone and then they you again and call you again and call you again, they're grabbing at you, right? Or say like you guys have plans together and uh, then you need to change your plans because of impermanence and they get frustrated because you changed your plans. They're having craving, desire, attachment. So when you see these kinds of things occurring, then you learn that early on in a relationship, like when somebody calls you, you sometimes don't answer the phone, even if it's sitting right there and it's so easy for you to pick it up. You don't answer the phone and see what happens. Do they blow up your phone? Do they get angry? Do they get frustrated? And the more angry and frustrated they get, the more and more you would like to kind of put distance where when they call you, then you don't answer the phone and you wait several hours or even days before you call them back. This is the most loving kindness and compassionate thing you can do because as soon as you allow craving, desire, attachment on their side, or your side to form, 
this relationship's going to become discontent at some point. It's just a matter of time and it's going to be over. So early on in your relationship, you kind of look at those things. Are they calling you every day? Are they sending you text messages every day? Are they getting angry at you when you don't answer them? Are they blowing up your phone? Are they putting expectations and their wants on you? And where you see these things occurring, you skillfully put more and more distance between that. And it doesn't mean that you're distant in the relationship. You just step away where like, instead of answering their phone right away, you let it roll to voicemail or don't answer it and then call them back a couple of days later. Or if you guys have plans together and there's a way for you to change your plan sometimes and say, hey, I know we were planning to go to dinner next week, but I've had a change of plans and I'm not going to be able to, to come, but we can perhaps go out another time. And you kind of see how their mind handles that. And if they're like, oh, okay, no big deal, you know, we'll do it another time. And if right away they're trying to grab on and like, let's book it right now, you can see that there's craving there. And you're like, hey, let's not, let's not schedule it right now. I'm not really sure what my schedule is. So why don't I just get back to you when I'm ready to go out to dinner? So you kind of create this impermanence in your relationship where they're not constantly craving for you to do things a certain way. So you intentionally inject some impermanence with your phone calls, your text messages, your appointments and dates and things that you do. You intentionally put some impermanence in there and keep things to the point where their mind can't grab on. And if you do this early on, it's best because their mind hasn't really potentially grabbed on really tightly yet. Uh, if you have current relationships where these things are going on, you can slowly create some space in your relationship where they get more and more comfortable and they're probably going to get angry and frustrated at different times. And if they get so angry and so frustrated, the relationship ends, then okay, so be it. Because it was going to end eventually anyway because of discontentedness. But if you create a life for yourself where you have all these friends and all these people and family members that are just grabbing at your time, and if you don't do what they want, which is reply to their text message in five minutes, they're going to get angry at you. You're going to have a bunch of angry people in your life dealing with all this discontentedness. So you would like to create a life around you where people aren't putting their expectations on you and where you see that occurring, create more and more distance. And then uh, it will help you <clears throat> to get to a point where you don't have people constantly grabbing at you and then they're not going to get angry and frustrated and they're not going to be blaming you for the feelings that they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Is it Miso? What, what, I, what's your name? Yeah, my name is Junko. And, um, Miso, right? Uh, Junko. 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 Uh, okay. Yeah, I came here two months ago. Yeah, I remember. I here. It's very um, glad to be here. Yeah, I just see you today for, the, yeah, for a long time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I'm not sure the, how to deal with my complicated feelings sometimes. It's, it's, I regret sometimes, uh, I wish I, I, could, I could treat my son better. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's past, it's, it's done. So, but uh, um, I know, so or I'm, I know I'm not a per, um, perfect person. And then I maybe, um, I, I, I made her uh, the best decision at the time, so, um, but I, I still um, sometimes I I regret my decision or um, so like like um, I sh I should have um, raised my son um, better. So uh, but I couldn't help now. So um, so it comes um, it's, um, actually often and then but I like to. <laughs> uh, Cut off, <laughs> cut off is to, uh, uh, to um, not polite, but uh, oh, because I can't deal with uh, um, that um, issue right now, so it's done. Um, but uh, so those regretful, um, regretful, uh, regretful feeling come to my mind sometimes. Um, it's it's. It's a called past time, so, um, but I'm not sure how to deal with those feelings. So. 
Okay. I, I love myself, I love my son, um, and then I know I'm not pers a perfect person. Okay, can you give me an example of something that you've done that you feel comfortable sharing, that yeah. you feel regretful about? Yeah, so, um, so the first one, maybe I was so busy, so, so uh, still I was in Japan uh, at that time, and then um, I didn't, I didn't uh, um, um, make a time for him, uh, so properly, and then also, um, when I was in in America, so my son uh, stay in Japan. Um, then, so he asked me about some money, and then so um, so I yeah I suggested him so how how to deal with the money. So and then so you you could uh, do this stuff, and then if if it doesn't so if it wasn't it uh, doesn't, uh, uh, sorry, it uh, wasn't solved um, yet, so um, I'm, I'm going, I am going to suggest uh, another, um, another, another stuff to solve it. Um, so, um, I'm, so that, 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 that uh, the other two example, so, um, so maybe I should have, I should have spent more um, time um, um, to to make him to uh, to to raise uh, to raise him up uh, well, or and also um, I should I should <laughs> have. Um, going back to Japan um, when he have a, some pro, um, program, uh, but I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't go back mm -hmm. at the time. So just so we talk uh, um, um, on the phone or in, online. Um, I think I I did the best for him, but maybe there might some the another best. Uh, um, it's a way to solve it. Um, I'm not sure that I understand 100%, but let me try to see if I can ask some questions to clarify. Are you regretting that you didn't let him borrow money? Are you regretting that you didn't go back to Japan to be with him? Where, where was the regret? Uh, so what to regret? Um, yeah, it was... I'm not so sure. So hearing so the today's class, I thought so. This this might be my craving desire judgment. <laughs> uh, I should be perfect, or um, or or oh, I and other way. I don't. I didn't. I'm. I might not um, have believed himself. So. Some, some, yeah, some feeling come out. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I gave him um, some money, so he asked me. So there's um, uh, some program might sort, but might not sort. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm still not sure that I understand 100%, but I'll just answer Sorry. you to, <laughs> to what I understand. It's okay. Um, whenever there's regret in the mind, this is a discontent feeling, and it's coming from craving, desire, attachment, that longing, yearning. There's something that your mind is longing, yearning for, whether it's to be a perfect mom, whether it's to your craving to make sure he has the money that he wants, you know, whatever it is that you're feeling regret about, mm -hmm. there's some cravings there that are causing that regret to arise. And if it's you're craving to be a perfect mom and you've done something that you feel that was unwise, mm -hmm. this is your expectation, this is your want, this is your longing, your yearning. Not understanding that, of course, your mind isn't enlightened, so there's still these pollutions of craving, anger, and ignorance in the mind. And as long as that's there, you're going to make unwise decisions that are going to produce unwholesome results. So you can't be perfect. And 
in each situation that you encounter where you've done something that you wish you would have done differently, that's a learning opportunity for you to learn rather than beat yourself up that I wasn't perfect in this situation. Realize that your goal in this life is to learn from each one of these experiences that you have and gain wisdom from it. So if your goal in life is is to gain wisdom, then everything you do in life is to gain wisdom. So you're never a failure because even when something doesn't go the way you had intended, okay, you learned from that. And that was your ultimate goal was to cultivate wisdom, Mm -hmm. but not to be perfect in this particular moment. So in situations where you've done things opposite of the way you, you know, were interested to do it. Okay. So I didn't do that. Well, what can I learn from this? Okay. In the future, if the same situation occurs, rather than do it this way, I will do it this way. And now this is success. This is success that, okay, that situation didn't go well, but you used it as an opportunity to cultivate wisdom so that now the next time you encounter that same situation, you will have more wisdom and you will uh, do things differently. So always looking at yourself as a work in progress Mm -hmm. is really important. Mm -hmm. Even when your mind's enlightened, you don't just cross the finish line. There is no finish line, but you don't just cross the finish line and be like, all right, you know, I'm done. Instead, you've cultivated this life to get to enlightenment where you're constantly cultivating wisdom. And once the mind gets to enlightenment where your mind is peaceful and joyful for the rest of this life, you still cultivate wisdom. You're still, there's many things to cultivate wisdom about. So in these situations where you haven't been what you would like to have done with your son, just use it as an opportunity to learn and grow, realize you're a work in progress and just keep cultivating wisdom. And where you need to apologize or say sorry to your son for certain things that you've maybe not done well, then apologize. But always be aware of your cravings because your craving, desire, attachment is what's causing this regret to arise. It's either craving to be perfect or craving to provide your son one particular thing or another, and you're not going to be able to do those things permanently at this point. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions that you guys have here? So this one actually connects bottom three principles. Um, Specific to self-love, when someone is capable of taking them out, spending a lot of time um, going on hikes and everything, but unable to show generosity towards individuals they don't know, at what point where this self-love turn into more selfish behavior, only caring about their own well-being? And from other side, if we are other practicing more spiritual part, part where we practice both sides, how can we then build a nourishing relationship with these individuals with lots of love and compassion for, the, for their well-being? Okay. So on one side is like conceited, right? Or where the mind's like arrogant and prideful and thinking you're so great and so wonderful. That's not what you're interested in. But over here where you're diminishing yourself, degrading yourself, thinking that you're horrible, that's not where you're interested in, in being either. You like to come to this middle where you can have appreciation and gratitude and love for this being, meaning you would like to see this being be well. And that means that sometimes you're going to need to work. Sometimes you're going to need to rest. Sometimes you'll go out with friends. Sometimes you'll go out alone. Uh, This is all part of loving yourself and, you know, taking yourself out to dinner, buying yourself something if that's what you need and pursuing your needs versus your wants. So not degrading yourself. And that's going to take the full path to help you train to do that because where you see the conceit, you got to cut that back. And there's certain teachings that we share to eliminate the ego and the arrogance, but also where you see your mind diminishing yourself and degrading yourself. You need to cut that back and train your mind to not do that any longer either. So you can come to this middle more and more, and it takes time to be able to get to that point. And then as you learn how to love yourself, then you can also learn how to practice generosity. Since you're talking about this towards others, you can Practice whether it's somebody you know or somebody you don't know. You do what you feel comfortable with, 
right? And then if somebody else is interested in having a relationship with you, either friends or, uh, you know, coworker or something, then great. If they're not interested in having a relationship with you, then that's fine too, because not everyone's going to see you as a wonderful person, right? This is impermanence. Sometimes we have this burden that we carry around that we want everybody to look at us in a, in a positive light. But based on what's going on in their minds and what they're struggling with, they might not be able to see your love and your kindness and your compassion and your 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 generosity and these kinds of things. So you're going to need to get comfortable with some people are going to be able to have a wonderful relationship and some people aren't. And where, pe- where it's just not working, don't try to force it. Don't try to control it. If somebody is just not interested in a relationship, then okay, that's fine. Or if somebody looks at you in a degrading and disparaging way and thinks negatively of you, it's better to just move on. Don't maintain that relationship because having that negativity around you all the time is just going to degrade your own mind. So in situations where you can have a healthy relationship and you and that other person are comfortable having that relationship, wonderful. And where it doesn't work, you just move on. And if you're practicing the full path in training your mind to get rid of more and more pollution of your mind, you'll be able to then practice with that moral conduct and all those other things that I taught on the Eightfold Path <clears throat> to have more loving and friendly relationships. And you'll see this is what comes back to you. But right now, if you're not practicing the Eightfold Path and dialing that in really closely, there's certain things that you're doing in the relationships that aren't wise. And when you're doing those unwise things, it's producing unwholesome results. So that's why I say if you're in a relationship where there's been enough of that going on and you're not committed to the relationship, it's oftentimes best to just move on. And in other situations where you're more committed, like maybe your parents or your siblings or something, life partner, children, <clears throat> this one you'll really sort out and you'll maintain the relationship, but you've got to get to a point where you're not attached in the relationship. And then there'll be new people that you'll completely meet. So by getting rid of your attachment to wanting this person to be a certain way and just being comfortable to exist in the relationship with people as they are and love them as they are, then you can spend more uh, or you can be more harmonious in these relationships. You're welcome. Okay, I see some comments here online, but nobody's asking any questions, so uh, I don't see any questions online either. So what I'm going to do is is in this portion of our, our class here, by thanking you guys for coming, those of you guys that are just here for the morning, I realize that you uh, people come and go at different times. If you guys would like to stay for our next talk, the next thing that I'm going to be sharing with you guys uh, as part of this course is practicing in a world of the unknowing relationships with non-practitioners. This is a topic that is very helpful because as I was referencing in uh, the the the, the topic of true love is that you might be in relationships where people aren't practicing these teachings and they don't understand things like the Four Noble Truths or the things that you're learning about the natural law of gamma or the full path. And it might be coworkers, it might be neighbors, it might be family members. So I'm going to provide you guidance on how to practice in this world where people just don't understand the teachings that their mind is causing their own discontentedness and they might be blaming you for the things that they're experiencing. So if you guys would like to take a a 15 minute break, it's uh, 10 minutes after 11. Uh, We can come back at uh, 1125 and I'll pick it up from there and uh, enjoy your break and we'll see you perhaps after break. Sawadee
thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Oh,